Good afternoon. My name is Charles Clark. I've had a life in politics and a family history in the Baltic. I want to welcome you to this event, whose purpose is to commemorate the 100 year anniversary of diplomatic relations between Estonia and the United Kingdom. On 26th of January 1921, exactly 100 years ago, the United Kingdom gave formal de jure recognition to the Republic of Estonia and we want to commemorate that event. The event is organised by the Centre for Geopolitics at Cambridge University, jointly together with the University of Tartu, and in collaboration with the Estonian Embassy in London, the British Embassy in Tallinn, and the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It forms part of a broader series of events that we're organising on Britain and the Baltic. The event this afternoon will last two hours, and end at 1600 UK time. We have an online video panel, and after an opening by Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, we will move to introductory remarks from Patrick Salmon and Carol Pirimai, whom I'll introduce in a minute. They'll make a presentation about this history and what it's meant for uh, both Estonia and for the UK. And I will then moderate a discussion with those two for about 20 minutes. We will then be joined by Mark Folmer and Wendy Morton MP, representing their governments and the two ambassadors, one in uh, London and one in Tallinn, and we'll then have a further discussion. Throughout, you, the audience, will be able to see and hear me and the panellists. Your own microphone and camera is switched off automatically, so at no time will you be heard or seen by anyone in this webinar. At the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A op op option which will run across the screen and you can click on it and when it opens you have the chance to slide to type questions which I will feed into the discussion where I can. Finally, I also want to let you know that this video panel is being recorded and we will post the recording on our website over the next few days. So we're looking forward to what I think will be a very positive and a very interesting afternoon. Uh, and I hope that you will find it illuminating and worthwhile. And as I say, I want to begin with a message from the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson, who's going to talk a little bit about his appreciation of the importance of this relationship. So now a slide should, uh, a, a video will come up of Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister. The 26th of January marks exactly 100 years since our two countries established diplomatic relations after Estonia's successful fight for independence. I know from my visits to your country not only what a fantastic and beautiful place it is, but how much we both value the warm friendship that exists between our two nations. And the presence of the 850 British troops at Tapa is a very real symbol of our commitment to the security of Estonia and the wider Baltic region. But of course, our friendship goes right back to the days and events we're commemorating today, when in the struggle to achieve full independence, our Royal Navy fought alongside you against tyranny and in defense of freedom. 112 UK servicemen lost their lives in Baltic waters between 1918 and 1919 and their sacrifice is commemorated on identical plaques in the Church of the Holy Ghost in Tallinn and in Portsmouth Cathedral. Now, as we look forward to the next 100 years, I have every confidence that Estonia will continue to grow and thrive, and that we will continue working together as great friends on shared global challenges. Well, I'm sure you'd all want to thank the Prime Minister for giving us that message, which sets the context uh, of this afternoon. So with that, we move into the first part of our discussions this afternoon. I'm going to introduce firstly Patrick Salmon and secondly Karo Pirimai to make uh, presentations of how this history is evolved. First, Patrick Salmon. Patrick, whose picture you can now see on the screen, is the Chief Historian of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK and has been since 2003. If you wonder what a Chief Historian does, he manages the Historian's team at the Foreign Office, he manages the official history programme 
of the Foreign Office with documents on British policy overseas and edits individual volumes in the series. He provides to ministers, to Foreign Office departments and overseas posts advice on history. So it's a key role which Patrick has fulfilled with distinction. Prior to that, he was a professor of international history at the University of Newcastle on Tyne for four years. And he's written on the Baltic nations, in particular co-editing with John Hyden in 2014, a book called The Baltic Nations and Europe, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania in the 20th century. So he's not simply a historian with a global view, he has a very clear and direct personal understanding and interest in the history of the Baltic Sea and of the Baltic nations in particular. He did his uh, undergraduate, then graduate education at Peterhouse in Cambridge, and then studied at the Institute for European History in Mainz in Germany. So Patrick, we're really delighted that you've been ready to give time to this today and look forward to your introduction describing the history of the diplomatic relationship and the UK perspective over history. Patrick Salmon. Thank you, Charles. And um, it is a great honor indeed to be invited to speak on the centenary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Britain and Estonia on the 26th of January, 1921. When we first discussed this event, we were hoping that it could be held in Tallinn. Alas, that was not to be for obvious reasons, but it reminded me of my last visit to Tallinn, in fact, my only visit, and that was as long ago as midsummer 1991, when I was attending a Baltic Studies conference. It was a time of great tension. The Soviet Union had already launched an attack on the Lithuanian parliament, and in Tallinn I saw huge the narrow streets that led up the hill uh, to prevent a similar attack. I recall evidence of the environmental damage wrought by decades of Soviet rule. Um, I noted in my diary after a thunderstorm the sulphur-fringed puddles that I, that I saw in the streets. I also recall a complete absence of milk because the Soviets had cut off the supply of glass milk bottles. And of course I recall much, much hospitality and people already making plans for the future as if the Soviet Union was already an irrelevance, as indeed of course it was soon to be. And those memories made me think that Estonians, men like Ernst Peep and Jan Tönnesen, most of them young men in their thirties, and I think we should remember nearly all of them who were to end their lives in the Gulag, must have made a similar impression of down-to-earth practicality on the first British diplomats with whom they came in contact in 1918 and 1919. For example, Sir Esme Howard in Stockholm, who I've quoted here, uh, or officials like Oliver Harvey and E.H. Carr and John Duncan Gregory in the Foreign Office in London. That early impression of practicality was reinforced, of course, by the successful defence against first the Germans and then the Bolsheviks, aided, of course, as we know, by the arrival of Admiral Sinclair's naval squadron at Tallinn in December 1918, as General Johann Leidona later wrote, if the English Navy had not come to our rescue, it would probably have meant an end to Estonian independence on the 26th of December 1918, the day on which the Russian fleet arrived in Tallinn. Estonian diplomatic skills and their determination and capacity to defend their own territory, together with shared priorities, first anti-German, then anti-Bolshevik, help to explain why Estonia was the first Baltic state to receive de facto recognition as early as March 1918. And one of the first two, along with Latvia, to receive de jure recognition in January 1921. In fact, the close cooperation between Great Britain and Estonia in these years has something of the character of a special relationship. Yet, all special relationships are more special to one side than the other, and I'm afraid this was also the case with Estonia and Great Britain. The nearly three-year gap between de facto <clears throat> and de jure recognition is significant, for it indicates that Britain had much more on its mind and many more considerations to take into account before it would take that final step. The withdrawal of Britain's last Baltic squadron later in 1921 was an indication that Britain was reverting to its traditional stance of non-involvement in Baltic affairs. 
In fact, the period between 1918 and 1921 was an, an anomaly. For nearly a century, and in contrast with most previous centuries, it has to be said, a century roughly between the construction of Imperial Germany's high seas fleet and the end of the Soviet Union in 1991, Britain showed itself unwilling or unable to, to intervene in force, except in that very short period at the end of the First World War, when of course there was no German Navy and no strong Russia. And we can see the consequences of that reluctance in the very clear messages that British ministers and officials were giving Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian diplomats throughout the 1920s and 30s. As John Duncan Gregory put it, and I quote it here, Britain might give moral support, but not military protection in grave emergency. It was a message repeated many times. Sir Eyre Crow, the head of the Foreign Office, warned the Estonian minister Oscar Kallas in 1925 that Britain could, and I quote, never assume the role of special protector of the Baltic states. None of this is really a surprise. Once the direct threat to the existence of the Baltic states was removed, Britain reverted to its normal posture of non-involvement in Eastern Europe. Britain was, after all, a global power with a worldwide empire it already could hardly defend. And Britain could exert no military or naval power in a Baltic dominated by a strong Germany and a strong Russia, as it was by the late 1930s. If, according to Neville Chamberlain in 1938, Czechoslovakia was a faraway country of which we knew nothing, how much more remote were Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania? I would like to suggest, however, that relations between Estonia and Britain were closer than they appeared on the surface. One area was in trade and finance, where Estonian agricultural expert exports to the UK grew steadily, helped by Estonia's membership of the Stirling area from 1931 and the conclusion of a bilateral trade agreement in 1934. Another, as we can see here, was defence. Without any formal treaty relationship, the British authorities took an interest in Estonia's capacity to defend itself against Russia. As, through, as shown here by Lieutenant Colonel Nosworthy's report of a tour of the Baltic States in 1925, which noted that the small but efficient Estonian Air Force had been entirely trained by a former RAF officer. And its equipment at that point was entirely British, although it notes here, last year, three modern French scout machines were purchased. And just as an, a parenthesis, we should note that actually in the 20s, France was our main rival in Eastern Europe, not Germany or Russia. Estonia stood relatively high on a priority list for British arms exports drawn up in 1937. Out of 37 countries, Estonia stood 12th, just behind Finland and just ahead of Latvia and Lithuania. And it was also one of the most important listening posts of British intelligence. MI6 officers were stationed in Tallinn, along with Helsinki and Riga as really the best places they could possibly be to gain intelligence on what was going on in the Soviet Union. As the international situation deteriorated in the late 1930s, the Foreign Office decided to bolster the British presence by sending a Foreign Office Minister, Lord Plymouth, to the Finland and the Baltic States. His visit in June 1937 was the only visit by any British minister to any of these countries between the wars. And it succeeded in annoying both the Germans and the Russians, which of course was exactly the point. Reporting on the visit, The Economist noted with satisfaction that for Finland and the Baltic States, Britain was, and I quote, becoming their commercial and in many ways their political metropolis. Given the nature of the Nazi and Soviet regimes and their capacity to dominate the Baltic region, once they'd recovered their military and political power, this was clearly over-optimistic. Yet, even in these darkest years, British diplomacy delivered two major services to the Baltic states, ones that would eventually pave the way to the restoration of their independence in 1991. First, in the Anglo-French-Soviet alliance negotiations in the summer of 1939, the British refused to accept the Soviet definition of indirect aggression, 
which would have allowed the Red Army to march into the territories of the Baltic states in advance of any German attack. This was the main reason why the negotiations collapsed, and of course, why the Soviets then turned to Nazi Germany, which had no such scruples. Secondly, in the summer of 1940, Britain refused to accept de jure the incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union. It maintained that refusal even after 1941, when the Soviet Union became an ally and exerted strong pressure on the British to change their minds. As a result, the legations of Estonia and the other Baltic states were never closed down, enabling August Torma, then minister in London, to represent the Estonian people until his death in 1971. True, there was one disgraceful event, the sale of Estonia's gold to the Soviet Union in 1967. But this shabby episode was swiftly reversed after the United Kingdom became one of the first nations to reopen an embassy in Tallinn in 1991. Since 1991, commercial, political and security interests have been integrated to an extent that would have been unimaginable between the wars. Britain and Estonia have become partners and allies in NATO and until recently in the European Union. Frameworks exist that did not exist between the wars and Britain has shown itself willing to make commitments that it was unwilling then to make. In a remarkable revival of a partnership that was forged between Britain and Estonia a hundred years ago. Thank you. Patrick, thank you very, very much indeed for that. Um, it certainly set a whole set of thoughts and um, considerations going in my mind for questions uh, for our later discussion. Thank you for the uh, really substantial clarity you gave on the whole of this relationship. Our second historian is Karel Pirimai. He is the Associate Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Tartu. Uh, he studied also at the Estonian Military Academy and then the Estonian War Museum. He's worked at uh, one point for the Office of the President of Estonia uh, some 15 years ago. He had a PhD from Cambridge University uh, on the Baltic question in Allied diplomacy and Estonia, the Baltic question and the big three were his theses in his master's and his doctoral theses. He was supervised by Professor David Reynolds, who's still very active uh, at the university here and doing a great deal. Uh, Karel is going to try and summarize the UK's part in Estonian independence uh, and describe the importance of the UK relationship to Estonia over the period. Uh, we're very grateful for your uh, readiness to participate, which is a very concrete symbol for our Centre for Geopolitics of the partnership with the University of Tartu, which we hope will take on more dimensions uh, in future time. So, Karel, thank you very, very much for being part of this, and we look forward to uh, what you're going to say to us. Karel Pirimai. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. Um, I cannot speak uh, much about the time before the 20th century. In British sources, uh, there is very little specifically about Estonia, which at the time was part of Russia. However, I have been intrigued uh, to find out that there is quite a lot of scholarship on Britain's dependency on the Baltic trade in the 18th, 18th century and the first half of the 19th century. Uh, Britain as a naval power was heavily dependent on uh, resources from the Baltic area. I'd like to illustrate this point with a few images uh, uh, from these uh, times. And on the right, you can uh, see um, a really mysterious tool that is still to be found in uh, many Estonian ho households, but its function is uh, largely forgotten. It's a tool for uh, processing hemp, which was uh, the material for making ropes and sails, all crucial for any navy bent on dominating the 
uh, waves. Beside hemp, there was linen, Baltic, Baltic timber, and masts for ships from Riga, uh, all considered uh, the best in the world. And this has prompted historian uh, James Davy to conclude, and I quote, importation of Baltic goods was essential to the British way of life, industry, and economy. One should add, perhaps, that this British trade was also significant uh, part of the Estonian peasant economy at the time, allowing our forefathers to buy off uh, their farms from the German landlords lords, and lay the basis for a future bourgeois state. It is not much of an exaggeration to say that it was because of hemp that the Royal Navy sailed into the Baltic in 1801 and bombed Copenhagen in 1807. However, uh, it was around the time of the Crimean War in the uh, 1850s that iron replaced wood and steam power replaced sail. Thus, at the same time as Britain was intervening in Baltic affairs in the most forceful way ever, uh, leveling Russian fortifications in the Orland Islands and setting foot on the small islands in the Bay of Tallinn and terrorizing Tallinn for several years, a long-term decline in British interest in the Baltic Sea area set in. The expansion of possessions in India, Africa and elsewhere meant that in terms of not only military strategy but also culture, those parts of the world together with the Mediterranean as the key line of communication would always be much more important for Britain than the Baltic. When Prime Minister Chamberlain referred to the Sudeten crisis as a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing, he really meant it. Historian Tony Jute has remembered, speaking about post-war Britain, that English language of uh, English knowledge of Europe ended in Berlin and Vienna, and places like Prague or Warsaw, not to speak of Tallinn, were much more exotic than uh, Borneo or Nairobi. And the Cold War no doubt uh, served to perpetuate that ignorance. Symbolically, uh, when uh, our man in Havana appeared in print in 1958, Graham Greene had decided uh, to re relocate the novel's characters and plot from, from pre-war Tallinn, which had inspired him during his visit there in the 1930s to a more familiar Cold War setting in Cuba. Soviet occupied Tallinn really was a forgotten place. Uh, British naval intervention in the Eastern Baltic in 1919, uh, which was a very, very much crucial for Estonia's effort to maintain its independence, was an exception rather than a rule. In the coming age of aircraft and rockets, the narrow Baltic Sea was not a sea where British admirals would want to operate, especially with surface vessels. The operation of 1919 was only possible because both Germany and Russia were on their knees. And it was also associated primarily with Winston Churchill, who was unique for his enthusiasm about the Baltic. In the Second World War, he would again contemplate operations in the Baltic Sea, however, this time in cooperation with the Soviet Union. And this implied his willingness to accept Soviet control of the Baltic states. However, nothing came of these plans. The, the admirals had no patience with Churchill's plans in 1939, and in 1944, Stalin would not allow British submarines to enter the Baltic through the White Sea Canal, completed by slave labor just before the war. Back in 1918, Britain was the first major power to establish relations with the Estonian national movement, desiring secession from Russia. Although the British 
uh, vacillated, vacillated between the Estonians and the Russian white movement. They were very helpful from the Estonian point of view. In the interwar years, British businessmen were the main investors, even, even though credit was scarce and the official London, just like the majority of governments, was skeptical about the Baltic state's ability to remain independent for long. Britain had a very good reputa reputation as a champion of small states and its investments were preferred to those of Germany. Whatever real politique Britain was forced to engage in in the Second World War, one must, must not lo uh, lose sight of the fact that Britain went to war over precisely those far away peoples uh, of whom it knew nothing. Moreover, in 1939, as Patrick Salmon uh, also mentioned, Chamberlain refused to allow the Soviet Union to have a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, a decision bitterly criticized by the anti appeasers Churchill and Eden. It was completely unavoidable that Britain had to make deals with the Soviet Union, upon whose military effort the Allied uh, war, war effort largely depended. Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden came very close to recognizing the Baltic states as part of the Soviet Union. In the, in the end, what mattered more, more was that he did not. Britain, along with the United States, never recognized the Soviet annexation of the Baltic states, so that when the na Baltic national movement was able to reassert itself in the 1980s, it could do so on the basis of state continuity. And, and Britain supported that line even in the 1990s and uh, still does today. As any other country, Britain has been torn between the necess necessity of dealing with Russia and supporting Baltic self-determination, things that have been mutually exclusive most of the time. As in other uh, countries, there is a large group of people attracted to Russian culture and identifying as Russian specialists, while one has to search for experts on the Baltic states with a microscope. It is surprising how well Estonia has fared in garnering, garnering the support of the British government, with the wider public having almost no clue. But I would suggest, suggest that this has had more to do with Russian Russia squandering the goodwill uh, than Estonia being particularly skillful. There was never a strong Estonian uh, community in Britain that could promote Estonian interests. After the Second World War, the British government did not recognize university or technical school diplomas or the Baltic refugees, although most of them were better educated than the, their own folk. It was characteristic of the British class society around the time when Christine Keeler was still young that you had to go to bed with the right guy to achieve anything. So in 1991, when the old men, diplomats from the pre-war years were already dead, it was a lady called Nora Morley Fletcher, a daughter of an Estonian general, who conspired to arrange for the Estonian Foreign Minister Leonard Murray to meet the Prime Minister of Britain. This was great success. <clears throat> Baltic gold has been, had been sold in the 1960s by the Labour government of Harold Wilson in order to bribe the Soviet government to buy British consumer goods. The house of the former Estonian embassy had been sold to the Sultan of Oman to avoid council tax payments. However, in, the same, in 1991, on the same day that Estonia and Britain signed the Declaration of Restoring Diplomatic Relations, London gave back the gold as well as the proceeds from the sale of the house. The gold was used as security for the first currency reform in the former Soviet Union, rocketing Estonia to be the star of the post-Soviet world. And the, sum, uh, to buy, and the other sum was used to buy a new building for the embassy. Estonia was back. 
documents from the archive uh, of the Estonian Foreign Ministry bear witness to the very close relationship that Britain uh, built with Estonia. This definitely merits further research, but I would highlight the role of a few individuals, Douglas Hawk, Roderick Lyon, who had visited Estonia in 1979, but particularly the late Brian Lowe, who went to Tallinn in, in October 91 alone with $20,000 in cash that he placed in the safe of the US Embassy and went on to re-establish re the British Embassy. I'm sure these men had hard times arguing for the Baltic states against the interests of the Russianists in the Foreign Office, the government, the experts and, sc and scholarly community that was almost uni uniformly allergic toward the, towards the Baltic. However, nothing further their cause more than Russia itself. The rest is history, as they say. NATO enlargement, uh, comradeship uh, in arms in Helmand, royal visits, and now British soldiers in Tapa. And one should never forget culture, most popular, mostly popular culture that holds sway over many Estonians who love the English landscapes, houses, and dresses of downtown Abbey or Midsummer murders. And who can blame them? Thank you. Karel, thank you very much. That was, again, absolutely fascinating and um, with a large number of insights which were very, very valuable. We're now going to move to a discussion with Patrick and Carol, which I will moderate for about 20 minutes uh, to go through and pursue some of these points. Um, and I think the uh, place that I'd like to start is on the economic and trade relation to which both of you referred. You, Patrick, mentioned that Estonia was part of the economic sterling area in the 1930s. And Karel talked about the economic history, for example, with Navy supplies and, and how it moved forward. I wonder if both of you could just talk a little bit more about this economic relationship. It's not obvious, I would have thought, that Britain would have any kind of strong economic relationship with Estonia in contrast to relations with, uh, you mentioned France, Patrick, but also Germany. Um, also Russia in a different context. Could both of you just say a couple of words on why you think it was that the British-Estonian economic relationship took place? I know, Carol, you mentioned the British tradition of supporting small countries and so on, but uh, uh, some more words on this would be of great interest. Patrick, would you like to kick us off? I can start um, with just a few sort of random points, really. One, I think, although Carl would know more about this, would be the reorientation of um, Estonian agriculture between the wars away from the Russian market towards overseas markets. And what the Estonians were doing was emulating the success, for instance, of the Danes in developing butter and bacon exports. Um, there's another point, which again, Carol picked up in some of his um, talking about investment, I think in the early 20s, there was a very strong um, wave of British investment in, in the Baltic, partly because they were looking towards the re-establishment of trade with Russia and the Baltic in a way had always been the route to Russia and the newly independent Baltic states were still thought to be potential. Um, that on the whole didn't happen, of course, for obvious reasons that the Russian the Soviet system developed in its own way and was not interested in, in that sort of uh, trade. But um, you do see uh, talks of a Baltic El Dorado. This was the phrase sometimes used in the early 20s. These, I suspect, and Carl may confirm this, these tended to peter out, I think, by, by the mid 20s. And then you've got a revival in the 30s. But I will have to say also, the British were very bilateralist in their development of trade with, with Estonia. They forced, I would say, use the word forced, through a special uh, purchase agreement, Estonia to buy 80% of their coal from Great Britain. All the Nordic countries and the Baltic states had to buy a certain proportion of coal from Britain in their trade agreements, but the Estonians had to buy more than anyone else. Carl may like to take up on some of those points. Thank you, Carl. Uh, could you add an insight in this? Yes, uh, this was excellent uh, summary, I think. Uh, I don't think I have much to add. I'm, I'm not an economic historian, and I, I think Patrick is, is, is quite right that uh, and, and I, I would also stress that uh, this was uh, uh, private 
private based so this was a individual businessman uh, not uh, uh, a government policy certainly i think in in the in the uh, early 20s and and uh, yes they i think they were hoping to enter the russian market for example the the tartu brewery ale uh, that i had on the slide it was uh, um, uh, an old business actually um, which was selling uh, bear the whole of the russian empire and yeah that's probably all that i have to say what what were the trading relationships between estonia and either the other baltic states or small markets or russia as a whole or sweden and the rest of scandinavia did estonia trade a great deal with those marketplaces as well as with britain uh, france or germany um Patrick. i could probably just quickly quickly comment um on the whole they their exports and their imports were, were with the largest largest european economies germany and and britain for obvious reasons the problem for the relations with other nordic and baltic countries was their products were rather similar so they're all in competition for those larger european markets and there wasn't that much scope for for trade between them anything to add carol no that's quite right okay thank you well now we, let me move away from economics and trade to the defense issues you were talking about and in particular the um second world war and patrick's point that uh, britain didn't accept the demands of uh, the russians for de jure recognition of um, estonian uh, being incorporated uh, into the soviet union and you contrast that with the events of 1967, where the Harold Wilson government did cave in to Russian demands in relation to some of these areas. So could we just talk for a few minutes about that period, 1940, 41, 42, 43, a uh, very complicated military situation, what the nature of the relationship was. So um, Patrick, first of all, why do you think that Anton Eden and the Britons didn't accept the Russian demand for acknowledgement de jure of Estonian incorporation inside the Soviet Union. Well, um, Carl's the expert on this because he wrote the thesis which I examined in Cambridge uh, some years ago. This was exactly what his sub subject was. I think the basic point is that actually there was quite a lot of opinion in, in the highest circles in Britain that did really wanted to uh, get in, get in very close with the Soviet Union uh, for good reasons. Obviously, there were our allies at that point, but were pre prepared to uh, disregard the interests of smaller states um, in order to pursue that. Um, I think Eden in the British government was much the strongest uh, proponent of a close relationship with the Soviet Union. He was, of course, foreign secretary at the time. Churchill was also very strong, as Carol was, was, was saying as well. Um, and if you look at the lower levels of the Foreign Office, um, there's a famous quote, to which I think I used, which John and I used in our book, um, that one Foreign Office official said, I do not believe the Baltic states are a European necessity. And we use that as the, our concluding chapter, arguing they very much were a European necessity. So it was actually, um, it, there was actually quite a strong feeling that we could disregard Baltic interests, but I suppose the counter argument was, one strong argument was we did not want to get on the wrong side of the Americans. Uh, the Americans were much stronger, actually, on, on this question than the British were. So we would we would annoy the Americans. And I suppose there was a re residual feeling that you shouldn't let countries, uh, you know, small countries down. That was what Nazis and, and that's what the Soviets did. Thank you, Carol. Um, uh, Patrick has deferred to your knowledge on this and your thesis at the time. Could you uh, elaborate what you think the reasons for this were? Well, Truth is, the Allies were in a very bad situation. Uh, there were basically, in, a, in essence, uh, three enemies of, of democracy, uh, all, all great powers, and you couldn't uh, defeat all three. So you had to uh, ma uh, make one of them at least uh, your ally. And so the least uh, dangerous uh, uh, Power at the time was Soviet Union, and uh, and that's how the um, uh, alliance uh, uh, was created. But the question really was, if if 
Britain should uh, recognize uh, openly and 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 uh, in written form that the Baltic states uh, belong to the Soviet Union or or not, whether the, uh, this should be uh, uh, like a, 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 a secret understanding, and and even. Uh, thought it would be better to have an open uh, agreement and also ne negotiate over, over other countries like Poland because uh, Poland as the more important ally Britain wanted to uh, assure that Poland would remain uh, independent to, a, to a, at least to a degree. So this uh, attempt to sign an agreement on the Baltic states uh, is 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 a, is a very complex question. You, you cannot uh, take a, a really a moral point of view and, and condemn it outright. Uh, maybe maybe a spheres of influence uh, agreement would have been better for for Eastern Europe in general, but uh, of course uh, not so good for the Baltic states. I mean, the importance of this is it resonated through time uh, to. Uh, uh, be able to, uh, as the Estonian communities uh, in Britain, for example, uh, used to be very concerned about the de euro de facto question. Uh, when we come to the Helsinki process and the uh, end of the Cold War, uh, the whole process of uh, uh, how this happened and the history was very much in the minds of people. So that's why I think it's so very interesting because it certainly cast its shadow over history um, 40 or 50 years later in a large number of ways. I wondered if any of you had any observations about the approach of Ernie Bevin, the Labour Foreign Secretary, immediately uh, after the end of the Second World War. He's had a biography just written about him, in my opinion, a good biography by Andrew Adonis. And I r read it with interest as the NATO was established. And uh, it didn't appear the Baltic states took much of a pace in his mind when he was thinking about how to deal with these questions. And he was a very anti-Soviet, anti-communist individual, was uh, Ernie Bevin. But that didn't seem to lead him to big support for Estonia uh, and, uh, and other um, Baltic states. But maybe that's wrong. I wonder, uh, Patrick, if you've got any insights on the immediate post-war foreign history of this. No, um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the Baltic states were not anywhere near the top of Ernest Bevin's mind. Um, even if you look at Finland, um, neighbouring Finland, um, it was virtually in the Soviet sphere at that time and w wasn't really, you know, considered a, a place where we could e exert any influence. Um, w one can note, of course, that there were attempts to um, destabilise the Soviet Union by infiltrating um, Baltic patriots into the Baltic states by our, by our secret services, nearly all of whom, of course, were picked up and then um, uh, murdered uh, by, by the Soviet authorities. But this is a very, very, of course, uh, un, under under the counter sort of operation, not the sort of thing that the Foreign Secretary would have take, taken notice of. So I think in the global scheme, really, um, they were just having to accept things as they were and try and try to ensure at this point that Soviet influence didn't, didn't spread any further west. You had to try to contain Soviet power as far as possible. And was the British support for the Forest Brothers and so on, uh, obviously it was secret in the way you're saying, but was it widely understood that that was taking place and the opposition to the Soviet Union from inside the Soviet Union was being actively supported uh, by the, the British supporting Estonian nationalists in those circumstances? I don't know the answer to that, but I believe that they were all betrayed from within. I would imagine this was a sort of Philby era. I don't know whether he was directly involved. Um, Carol may know more about this one. Carol, have you got anything you'd like to say about this? Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, important is that there were also the Estonian uh, military involved. So they uh, found the, the agents who were willing to go back to Estonia and and the uh, British uh, 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 assisted them, let's say. They, and these, these Estonian officers uh, had uh, earlier uh, served the, the German army. So it is a, a very uh, strange, strange episode, but, but uh, quite, quite um, 
Mm -hmm. That's how, how, how things are in, in, in this uh, uh, world of secret, secret uh, operations. Could both of you just comment a little bit, perhaps I'll come to you first, Carol, on how this history from this period, from 1940 and the Soviet uh, entry again into until, I don't know, the death of Stalin, how the period of this history influenced the way in which people thought about these problems when looking at the Helsinki process, uh, Ostpolitik, the uh, uh, period leading up to the end of the Cold War, was it a serious influence on the way people thought about it? Or maybe I'm exaggerating it. Carol, do you have a, a perception in this regard? Uh, well, the, the idea of the Forest Brothers and the resistance in the uh, 1940s uh, was really a very important uh, part of the Estonian um, national narratives in the in the 1980s and and in the freedom uh, struggle uh, during the singing revolution and 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 still today uh, you know it's it's part of the um, uh, identity of the armed forces and even not nato has, has taken note of it uh, but uh, as to international politics in the during the cold war then i, I don't think uh, this had much of a had much of a role, um, and it, you mentioned the Helsinki uh, process. Then, indeed, uh, the agreement uh, in, in uh, the end, end, how do you call it, the, the agreement of the Helsinki conference uh, recognized uh, the um, uh, said that uh, there won't be any changes in the, in the borders of, of Europe. Um, uh, in the future, uh, and the Soviet Union uh, actually thought that uh, this this uh, was a recognition of uh, their annexation of the Baltic states, but uh, this was actually not the case. And um, Estonian uh, diplomats and uh, activists understood it uh, exactly the other way. Uh, saying that um, uh, it, it recognized it, it the Helsinki uh, agreement uh, mm, uh, recognized the, the Tartu Peace Treaty uh, borders between Estonia and and, and Russia, um, and this again caused uh, would cause problems in Estonian Russian relations relations in the nineties. Thank you. Patrick, anything to add on this question? Um, not really, except to note that the Helsinki was the Russians got thought they'd got what they wanted, which was a guarantee of no change to the borders. But of course, the price they paid for that was the third basket, which was acknowledging um, you, the poss possibility of human rights activities within the Soviet bloc. And then you get Charter 77 and you get uh, in the 1980s, Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians again taking advantage of that provision in, in the Helsinki Agreement. For, for the last five minutes or so of this conversation, uh, just to ask you about that last period, in particular about the British-Estonian relationship during that period between about 1987-88 through to um, uh, independence being re-established, 1991 and thereafter, and perhaps then a couple of words about the, much later on, the Estonian membership of the European Union and NATO and the Britain's attitude to that of support or otherwise through that process. So if I could just ask you both uh, to comment on the, particularly on the narrow question of the British support or otherwise for the independence of Estonia and then its decision as an independent country to join the EU and to join NATO, uh, taking a perspective through from about 1986-87 or so through to the fall of the Cold War through till EU membership of those, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Estonian membership of those enormous international institutions. Patrick, perhaps I could come to you first. 
I think I'll confine my comments to the period between 1986 or so and, and, and 1991. But I think what one's seeing there, um, Britain by the, this time had developed a policy of, of, of encouraging change in the Soviet bloc, focusing, of course, mainly on the countries which were the most viable from that point of view, which were actually Poland and Hungary in the first instance. And much further back along the queue would have been the Baltic, three Baltic uh, states. And I don't think, I think what happened was that in a way the peoples of those countries forced the, the world to take notice of them through their own actions, through the singing revolution, if you like. And this was not actually entirely comfortable for Western countries like Germany, for instance, but also for Great Britain. If one thinks of that period, it was the period when Mrs. Thatcher was seeking to establish and did establish a very close relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev, promoting reform in Russia. Uh, I don't think Mrs. Thatcher quite understood that if he did reform communism in Russia, it would actually make communism stronger. But nevertheless, um, she, she instinctively understood that he was, he was working for change. But that, at that very point, anything that happened in the Baltic states and that threatened to st destabilize Gorbachev's position was worrying for people like Mrs. Thatcher and, and other members of the British government. So the British had to, had to really pursue a very cautious line and one does see on the part of all the larger Western states, actually, at this time, who's taking the, the lead in recognition? And it's smaller countries like Iceland and Denmark. So I think it's all tribute really to the Baltic peoples themselves for forcing this up onto the international agenda. But it's a very interesting you've brought uh, Mikhail Gorbachev into this discussion because, of course, it's always seemed to me that one of the areas he was not a reformer in any way was the idea of independence for the Baltic states. And in fact, um, I would argue that one of the reasons for his uh, removal from power ultimately was his inability to take his reform of the Soviet Union proposals through to acknowledging the necessity, if reform was to succeed, of giving independence to the Baltic states. And that, that at the end of the day, brought him down. Uh, Carol, your insights on this, please. Yes, I, I, I agree with Patrick. Uh, uh, I was trying to draw attention to these tensions also in my in my paper, and I, I suggested that uh, you know th this uh, needs to be studied. But uh, taking for example the uh, example of the United States, then uh, uh, um, such a, a, a big country has has, has ha virtually hundreds of uh, diplomats working on Russia, uh, but uh, almost none on on the Baltic countries. So, and I think this this was also the case uh, for for Britain, and and if you, if you uh, think of them as interest groups, then the Baltic uh, guys uh, are always in a, a very small minority in the in the decision making process. So, and and as I said, uh, it was it was all uh, Russia's uh, fault. I think uh, they had a lot of goodwill in the early nineties. But they squandered it. Uh, first, uh, there was the um, bombing of the of the parliament. Then there was a Chechen war, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, uh, but it, it's 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 not only this, but uh, 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 it's surprising how how uh, intimately uh, Britain was actually involved in the in Baltic affairs in the early 90s. For example, uh, they, were, they were helping to uh, clean the nuclear um, uh, reactor in Baltiski. They were involved in uh, getting the Russian uh, uh, garrison uh, military out from the from from Britain, from Estonia and, and Latvia. They were not uh, the uh, the main main countries like uh, Denmark or the United States or Sweden, but uh, following, following closely behind. And as to NATO, then uh, Britain was, of, of course, very skeptical of NATO enlargement because uh, British military thought that um, NATO is, first of all, a defense alliance and you, you couldn't uh, change it into a, a, a peacekeeping force or something else that, or, or a political organization. So they were very skeptical, but uh, eventually, uh, well, <laughs> it, it, it happened. I think we've had a tremendous session from these two absolutely uh, leading historians of this relationship in this period. 
you've both given us tremendous insights into this history and uh, I think will have helped everybody participating in this event to understand far more clearly how this relationship has evolved over the uh, first part of the hundred years that we are marking today. So can I thank uh, both um, Patrick Salmon and Karel uh, uh, Perimai for those presentations and for the conversation. So thank you very, very much indeed. We can't stop for the applause which uh, routinely would take place, though there'd been some mention of music, but the music uh, would have sent a message to you say thank you very much indeed. Um, Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Wendy Morton, MP. She's a minister in the British government for European Neighbourhood and the Americas and has been so since February 1920, 2020. Thank you very much indeed for coming, Wendy. Wendy was previously a government whip and was at the Ministry of Justice. She's the Conservative Member of Parliament for Aldridge Brown Hills, which is in the West Midlands, just west, west of Birmingham, since May 2015. She's had an interest in Parliament in sustainability, which overlaps very well with Estonian interests uh, as well. And when I was reading her biography, I saw that as an MP, she'd successfully completed all the stages of the Armed Forces Parliamentary Scheme which is a scheme which enables members of parliament to learn a lot more about the Royal Navy, the RAF and the British Army. And it's quite a tough uh, scheme. And I was delighted to learn that uh, Wendy had um, gone through that process and understands a lot about the defence conversations that we've been having already. We very much welcome you here today, Wendy, to talk about British perspectives and future challenges for the relationship between the two countries. I understand you're not able to stay for the panel later on, and of course we understand that, but we're very grateful that you've been ready to give time today to talk about the future of the relationship. So, Wendy Morton. Thank you, um, Charles. Um, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to say what a great pleasure it is to be here, albeit virtually, to celebrate and share this special occasion with our Estonian friends. On the 26th of January 1921, Prime Minister Lloyd George established formal diplomatic relations between the United Kingdom and Estonia, laying the foundations for the strong bilateral relationship we have enjoyed ever since. And today I am proud to be marking this centenary of friendship between our two nations. The United Kingdom prides itself on standing by its friends. From 1919, when we helped defend Estonian independence against tyranny, to the present day with British troops stationed at Tapa, our friendship with Estonia has remained absolute. In today's tumultuous times, it is indispensable to have strong allies with whom to tackle shared global challenges together. The United Kingdom and Estonia are the embodiment of such a vision. We are partners in NATO, we are partners in the Joint Expeditionary Force. Our soldiers have trained together, deployed together and fought together. As Churchill said in 1945, there is only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is fighting without them. In the United Nations, Nations Security Council, we work to defend the rules-based international system that keeps us all safe. We collaborate on security challenges in Afghanistan, Yemen and Iran, on political issues such as the situation in Belarus, on vital priorities such as increasing women's participation in peace processes across the world. Whatever the issue, the United Kingdom is privileged to be able to work with a friend as close as Estonia to defend human rights and international peace. The bond between our countries is underpinned by an appreciation for the same core values. When I visited Estonia in January 2018, in my capacity as a Member of Parliament, I saw firsthand a deep commitment to freedom of expression, to equality, to freedom of religion or belief 
and much, much more. This like-mindedness infuses the relationship between the United Kingdom and Estonia and fuels our collaboration. In this centenary year, such cooperation continues apace. Estonia will ho ho host the Global Conference for Media Freedom in November this year, continuing the campaign to shine a spotlight on media freedom that began in London in 2019. The UK will also host COP26 in the same month. In this moment, we have an opportunity to enable a low carbon and sustainable recovery from the damage that the COVID-19 pandemic has wrought. In the run-up to COP26, the United Kingdom and Estonia must collaborate to encourage others to increase their climate ambitions and to contribute more decisively to combating one of the biggest global challenges of our time. As we look forward to the next 100 years, I have the Prime Minister's confidence that the relationship between the United Kingdom and Estonia will grow and thrive. The fact that we have now left the EU does not mean that we have left Europe. I look forward to continuing and deepening the warm friendship between our nations and working to ensure a safer world for all. Palu Iene, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Wendy. We appreciate that intervention and understand that you can't stay for the panel, unfortunately, but uh, thank you very much for giving time today to make that very strong statement uh, of the British commitment to the future relationship. Many thanks. Now, um, our next contributor uh, is unfortunately not here at the moment. He'll be here in a second. He's Mark Volman, the Minister from the Under Foreign Affairs Under Secretary for European Affairs in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Estonia. Uh, but he's uh, apparently held up in another meeting. It'll be a few more minutes before he comes. Um, so um, I think I'm going to, uh, in a second, I'll go back to, uh, uh, to Patrick and... Uh, uh, Carol, if they're still on the line. Ah, Mart is here. Um, it's very nice to see you, Mr. Volmer. Um, I, I know you had a previous meeting. It was a bit of a rush to come over. But so it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce you. Mert Volmer is the um, Under Secretary for European Affairs in the Estonian Ministry for Foreign Affairs and has done that since the end of 2019. He was previously the Estonian ambassador to Denmark from 2015 uh, onwards. Um, and in between 2011 and 2015, he worked as the prime minister's advisor on international relations and foreign policy. He served in various capacities uh, in Vienna as the minister to the OSCE in St. Petersburg and as ambassador to Turkey. He was educated at Tallinn University and then the Estonian Business School. He's been close to the centre of foreign affairs within Estonia over a considerable period of time and has a great deal of experience. And so, Mert, it gives me a great deal of um, the pleasure to introduce you and to hear what you would like to say about the future challenges from the relationship uh, between Estonia and Britain. We look forward to hearing from you. Mert Volner. Thank you very much, and I'm uh, re really grateful for such a, a great introduction. Um, thank you very much, and um, I am actually really proud to to uh, have the opportunity to say a few remarks uh, before this uh, 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 distinguished audience today. And this is actually exactly 100 years since Estonia uh, received uh, the Euro recognition uh, of our good friend and ally, the United Kingdom. So that that is. Uh, uh, exactly the, the the day and hour that that uh, we should be speaking about um, those um, two thoughts and events here. But um, before looking at at, uh, at our future cooperation, let me just once more stress the importance of this uh, historic day for Estonia. And although um, Estonia had uh, proclaimed independence in in February 1918, and that's when we celebrate it. Uh, it, it took three years of persistent efforts uh, by, by diplomats and politicians uh, to achieve the Euro recognition of Western countries. So the international recognition was a turning point that meant uh, reinforced political and territorial stability for our uh, country. And of course, uh, paved the way for joining the League of Nations, the pre predecessor of, uh, of the United Nations today. 
uh, and that happened in September 1921. Um, so that's uh, <clears throat> that's the the story before, but of course today um, uh, Estonia has uh, successfully finished its first year in the United Nations Security Council as as a non permanent uh, member. So. A lot of things have changed in 100 years, so we are now there behind, behind the steering wheel. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we, we were uh, um, working side by side with our British friends on, on global peace and security issues. Bearing in mind, of course, the lessons of history, it gave us a unique view of uh, global security and the importance of international law and order. Well, that's what uh, keeps uh, Estonia uh, prospering. Today, there are countries and nations struggling for their right to be sovereign and free, and we bear a shared responsibility to support them in their aspirations. Uh, of course, it is our common responsibility to draw attention to human rights violations and to the attempts to suppress free and independent media. That is why Estonia has been an active member of UK-initiated Media Freedom Coalition, and is going to organize a second ministerial on this coalition in Tallinn uh, later this year. Besides the cooperation on multilateral level, uh, such as United Nations, Digital Nations, Media Freedom Coalition, so that there, there are many forums where we cooperate, uh, our bilateral and regional cooperation continues to develop uh, more and more. So I'm glad that uh, <clears throat> now we are actively working on Estonia United Kingdom bilateral strategy which will soon be officially launched. Uh, it's no secret that we share common values and common commitments, but uh, I was positively surprised by the variety and the number of areas where we already uh, work together or where there is an intention to start working together. Uh, one of the most promising future cooperation areas, um, along with natural ones like security, defense, cyber, digital innovation, is actually the development cooperation. Uh, cooperation in eastern neighborhood countries or sub-Saharan Africa is a new path to explore as Estonia is year by year strengthening its capabilities in this area. And we hope to move from the consultation phase uh, to the hands-on phase quite soon. So uh, at, at, um, at these great times of, uh, of global uh, corona pandemic, we all struggle to get our population vaccinated uh, as fast as possible. Um, so everybody is, is doing hard work, but um, Estonia and UK, alongside with many other countries, contribute to the World Health Organization's global COVAX facility, supporting 92 developing countries to access coronavirus vaccines. So there are <clears throat> quite sort of active things on, going on every day. Um, uh, during spring, Estonia also supported some of our NATO allies by, by sending personal protection equipment uh, when they were in, in the need. Uh, during last year, all countries in the world have dealt with enormous challenges, <clears throat> not only in health systems, but also in economy, welfare, education system, mental health, many, many areas. And this gives ground to more inward-looking policies. This is essential for us to continue to draw attention to less fortunate. And then we do keep uh, this promise. At the same time, we bear the responsibility to set an example by driving the green and digital economy, economic recovery. Successful recovery from the economic crisis needs investments that focus on the future. It's investments that will contribute towards digital transformation and that help to fulfill our uh, ambitious climate goals. And last but, but, but not least, uh, there is a long-standing defense and security cooperation, which uh, glues us together in a very unique way. It's uh, not, no overstatement to say that uh, the United Kingdom is our best and firmest ally in NATO. Uh, I have to point out that the uh, United Kingdom presence in Estonia is, is really very visible. We all vividly remember Prime Minister Johnson serving Christmas pudding to British troops in Tapa exactly a year ago. Uh, we have uh, hosted several UK fighters as part of NATO, uh, NATO's Baltic uh, air policing mission in Amari. We continue to defend peace side by side in Afghanistan. Uh, we have joined uh, joint efforts in, uh, in joint expeditionary force. 
are the Brits working in NATO Cyber Center, excellent in Tallinn. So, so there's, there's so many different areas, and, and uh, we actually foresee more cyber related activities in, in, uh, in the future on our bilateral strategy. So, uh, to uh, conclude this, uh, uh, let me thank Mr. Charles Clark. Uh, for the uh, initiative for launching the, launching the series of, of Baltic uh, geopolitics. And uh, I'm also very thankful to the University of Tartu and our respective embassies uh, for organizing today's event. Uh, and of course, I thank Prime Minister Johnson for his utterly warm and sincere words of friendship, um, recalling the old Estonian saying, one recognizes one's friend in trouble. So let me hope that uh, the times of trouble are behind us. Uh, we saw our friends, um, and uh, with our special uh, friendship, we will be able to bring hope and relief uh, to all people and nations who are in trouble today. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Mert, thank you very, very much indeed for that uh, tremendous message. Uh, what it conveys is a strong, strong desire to build and strengthen this important relationship, which is 100 years in. So many thanks for that. We're now going to move to a second panel, which will include Patrick and Carol, who uh, we had uh, firstly involved the historians. But we're going to add Mert and the two ambassadors, the British ambassador to Estonia and the Estonian ambassador to the UK. So firstly, to introduce the two ambassadors. Tina Intelman is the Estonian ambassador to the UK since uh, 2017. She joined the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1991. She has served as an ambassador from Estonia to the OSCE, permanent representative of Estonia to the United Nations and ambassador to Israel. And then unusually in the diplomatic service, she was elected in uh, 2011 as president of the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in The Hague and had a great deal of international experience there and then served as the head of the EU delegation to Liberia before arriving in London. So Tina, we're really delighted at you participating in this program and perhaps also on behalf of our um, uh, network, the Center for uh, Geopolitics, we can thank you for the support you've given to establishing that. And I also want to uh, welcome Teresa Bubia, the British ambassador to Estonia since 2016. Uh, she previously served in Budapest, Moscow, Helsinki and in South Africa. And she's played a distinguished role. And I, though we've never met Teresa, a lot of people have spoken very, very warmly about the way in which you uh, have played a role in the whole of this situation, uh, which has played such an important role. So thank you very much. Uh, so that is now our panel for the last part of this session. We've had a couple of questions already, and we've got more questions we're going to ask. But I'm going to kick off with a final one that came in on the Slido questions underneath. Somebody clicked in for the historians to finish off the history panel. Uh, and I think it has some contemporary implications again. The question that was submitted was, what made it possible for the Helsinki Agreement to be understood differently for both sides? How did Russia let it slip this way? I thought it was quite an interesting question that came in quite at the end of the previous session. So I thought I'd just ask Patrick and Carol if they had a remark to make about that, because it's a, a good one in diplomatic relations, how understandings can move in different directions. So perhaps, Carol, do you have any observations on that particular question first, and then Patrick, and then we'll go to the wider panel. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, at the time of the Helsinki Agreement, uh, 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 the former foreign minister uh, Vyacheslav Molotov was uh, still uh, alive and well, and he was the guy who negotiated with uh, Anton Eden to uh, sign an agreement uh, that the Baltic states um, are part of the uh, Soviet Union. So he thought the Helsinki Agreement uh, uh, acknowledged the Soviet view of the of the of history. But uh, the Estonian diplomats uh, 
and, and, and politicians uh, in the 1990s thought that the Helsinki Agreement accept, accepted the uh, borders of uh, the Tartu Peace Treaty. And, and these were different from the uh, 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 current borders between Estonia and, and Russia that uh, Stalin had uh, drawn in uh, 1944 and uh, 45. Uh, and and uh, this for Moscow, this basically meant uh, that Estonia was making territorial uh, demands, uh, claiming uh, territories. Uh, but for Estonia at the time, it meant that uh, they were restoring the uh, pre-war republic. And uh, but the uh, British diplomats actually uh, advised Estonia to. Uh, not to uh, um, claim territories and and go back to the Helsinki Agreement, uh, which, which uh, um, uh, stated that uh, all 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 borders that, that one should not change borders. That changing borders is is, is not the way of uh, sol solving any any uh, conflicts. much. Patrick, anything to add? Uh, well, going back to Helsinki itself, uh, I think the point was that this was the, the late late Soviet Union, uh, people like Kosygin in charge, they were not as, as sharp as people like Molotov. Um, and I think they were so desperate to get an acknowledgement of the post-war quo that they almost overlooked the significance of the human rights element in Helsinki. And I think this is a, an example really of wh where Western diplomacy was was very sophisticated uh, and Soviet diplomacy rather untypically was not very sophisticated. Soviets are usually very competent, but here I think they, they missed a trick. Um, just to put a plug in, uh, we FCO historians have published quite a lot of this material in our publications documents on British policy overseas. And even last year, we published another online publication, which you can get through Amazon, um, on, on a report on the preparations for Helsinki. So there's quite a lot of information out there. Thank you very much. Now, I now want to move to the future. And I think a starting point uh, for the conversation is the fact that Britain has now left the European Union. And so the question arises, what does this mean for the future relationships? How do we have to change behaviour? How does Britain have to change its behaviour? How does uh, the uh, how does Estonia change its behaviour? How does the relationship have to operate in different ways? And perhaps I could ask Tina uh, to make a couple of remarks on this first of all. You live in London, you represent Estonia in London, you've seen how the political climate around Brexit has flown around. Uh, how do you see this whole relationship changing, Tina? Uh, as a result of Britain leaving the European Union. Yes, indeed, Charles. Uh, of course, these uh, three, four years have been very strange because we have a uh, need to engage in this. And, and of course, the divorce has been amicable at the end of the day. But uh, but there has uh, there has. I think that there will now be a a, a period when we reassess what exactly should happen and how we should shape our lives. And doing that in bilateral consultations and also in, uh, you know, in, in Estonia. We're thinking about that and we're also thinking about what European relations with the UK should be like. Um, it, it's also true that uh, European itself is changing. And I think that if, if we give all of these processes some time, gradually we will, uh, we will understand what uh, will be necessary in our future relationship and what will not be necessary. Uh, trade relations are pretty much sorted out, but in the political interaction, um, things are still quite, quite open. And, uh, and I think that it will just require require some time so that uh, we need what is, ne what is necessary and what is not necessary. In natural relations, there is just one big pillar, which is defense cooperation. And that links us to NATO. And uh, this, is, is, this relationship is strong Thank and very, very Thank you. The connection wasn't so good for a few moments there, but I'm now going to ask 
Teresa, uh, you see it, as it were, from the other end of the partnership. How do you, as a British diplomat uh, in Tallinn, uh, see the decision to leave the European Union as affecting your relationships and how you can conduct your role in these current circumstances? Um, thank you very much, Charles, and thank you for the warm welcome. You won't be surprised to hear that I agree completely with um, Tina and everything that she has just said. I arrived in uh, Estonia just after the EU referendum in the summer of 2016, and there was a fair degree of shock and sadness, I think, here um, at the decision that had been taken followed immediately by a hefty dose of very Estonian pragmatism, which said, well, we've been through many things, many of them worse than, than this, we will get on with it. And as far as I can see, they and we have indeed got on with it, and we continue to get on with it. So although it's only very early days um, following the end of the transition period, just a few weeks, and there'll be all sorts of practical things that we need to sort out, I think it's really important to remember that Estonia is still Estonia. The UK is very much still the UK. We still care on each side about the things that we have always cared about. None of that has, has changed. And all the reasons that have brought us together, as we heard so clearly from the historians, um, they are still there. They still stand. And so none of our underlying values have, have changed and the very, very strong bilateral friendship which we have will remain and I'm quite sure will become stronger as Matt was saying a little earlier. We have a lot of things to look forward to. So um, Brexit, sure, as somebody put it to me, has been a bump on the road, but the road is long and smooth and straight and uh, we can and we will overcome bumps. So um, sure, some things that we need to do differently, uh, we're just figuring out exactly what those are and, and how we do them to make sure they move smoothly uh, with a lot of Estonian assistance. But fundamentally, uh, nothing has changed. This is a really strong relationship and it will remain that way. Thank you, Teresa. So optimism from both our diplomatic representatives about the continued relationship uh, and the commitment to it. But Matt, uh, in your position inside the uh, foreign ministry, uh, you must see that there can be tensions at some times between what the European Union is wanting to do and what the UK is wanting to do. There will not always be harmony in foreign affairs and other questions between the EU approach and the UK approach. And so how do you think uh, the Estonian foreign ministry will try and resolve any tensions, I don't say anything sharp, but any differences of approach, differences of emphasis on particular questions as they will arise? Well, I, I, I should um, start pointing out that, of course, there are no any challenges uh, at the moment. I mean, the cooperation is, is excellent. Um, we are we know all each other. It, it, it all sort of it goes on very smoothly. And I, I think Teresa mentioned one of the key words which, which she said is, is pragmatism that that's something that um, sort of is shared between our our two countries and nations uh, and other thing that i think we share is is also sort of common sense if we keep uh, feet on the ground and then we sort of decide things where, uh, while we go forward and and there are probably some areas where we uh, need some agreements, uh, some cooperation, something to negotiate, uh, some areas where the, the um, cooperation is already so well established that it sort of works uh, uh, basically without out any, any further agreements, we probably just have to keep uh, uh, working. So don't, don't break uh, if it's not broken or don't, don't fix it if it's not broken. So, um, so that there is not um, um, sort of the, 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 the fundamental base that, that we, we build our partnership is so good that, that I don't see any um, trouble uh, for uh, for tensions actually coming up. And, and, and as, as I mentioned in, in my speech, that there are so many those uh, bilateral initiatives uh, uh, where we already together, we'll, we'll, that all continues. 
uh, I'm sure we will come up with something new uh, while while we we keep the cooperation going. Um, uh, so um, I guess it, it sort of it will just uh, complement what we uh, we have in EU. Our four freedoms. Uh, it will be different with UK. Uh, it, I'm sure we will find a way how to make it sort of additional value added and and uh, complementary aspects here. And and uh, no, I'm, I'm looking with very positive uh, view. Well, what we can learn from these three interventions is a lot of optimism about the fact that there is a pragmatic way of addressing whatever tensions may arise in a good way. And I'm, for my part, from my knowledge of it, I'm certain that's true. But if you look at uh, some of the historical tensions which we've talked about earlier, um, do you see, Carol, any possible issues, if I can put it like that, of future tensions because Britain is no longer in the EU, which people should be thinking about now to try and head off difficulties. And I'll ask uh, the same question of our other historian, uh, though he speaks in a slightly more official hat and so no doubt will be more guarded in what he has to say. But um, Carol, could you just give your comment on what, what warning thing, what should people be thinking about it, as Britain's no longer a member of the EU, to prepare to achieve this stable approach, which the three diplomats have all identified. Karel? Well, the only thing uh, that comes to mind is, is that uh, this uh, direct involvement of, of Britain in, in the affairs of Eastern Baltic uh, is, uh, is, is, is really an exception. If we look at the... At the uh, uh, long term long term history but uh, maybe maybe it's the beginning of a of a new new era who knows so uh, um, I, I, I don't really i can't really uh, uh, comment uh, much uh, on, on on the future because it's uh, it's it's so open i think you know uh, any, anything uh, can happen if you if you think of, of uh, uh, a, a few decades uh, from from now now on, uh, one thing that, that can happen uh, uh, perhaps is that uh, uh, Britain would uh, rethink uh, its relations uh, with the EU again. You know, uh, it it has done it uh, several times uh, in in the in the in the in the past. Uh, uh, so that's that's one of the. Uh, uh, options. On things to watch for in the future that might be tensions which need to be avoided by preparing for them now. Well, I, I'm not going to, I don't think I can possibly speculate actually, if, if in an official or an unofficial capacity. Uh, I think <laughs> the future is, you know, uncertain to say the least. What I would say, just picking up on Carol's point about Britain's traditional non-involvement in the Eastern Baltic and I, he said that and I've also said that but I'm not sure that's gonna I don't think that ne will now necessarily change I think we will maintain a presence in the Baltic and I think that although we are no longer a member of the European Union we have plenty of ground and scope and experience in cooperating militarily and in, in defense terms in that region and the obvious framework is NATO, but it's worth remembering, of course, that two of our closest partners are Sweden and Finland, who are not members of NATO. Um, we are no longer members of the European Union, but the European Union has not really been a major military presence at all yet. It might become one in future. Um, in other words, there's all sorts of quite interlocking uh, relationships on the defence front in which Britain has been very active. Um, and actually has actually upped its presence in in the north in the northern region and in the Baltic in recent in recent years, and I'm sure that that will continue. Um, Britain again is pragmatic; other countries are pragmatic, and we have all sorts of ways of work, working together. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Well, let's put Brexit behind us. That's uh, we can say that's history, and we'll now move on to a positive future. Um, a question which has come in. Uh, on the Slido questions from one of the the audience is what, if any, is the role of expa expatriate communities in Estonian UK diplomatic relations? Um, I think in terms of the Estonian communities uh, which came to Britain post 1945 and then post 2004, significant communities. 
Um, Tina, perhaps you could start by talking about this, because, of course, one of your responsibilities is talking to the Estonian community in the UK. And then I'll ask Teresa to comment the other way around about the British exp expatriate community in Tallinn. What's the role, if any, the questioner asked, of the expatriate communities in contemporary diplomatic relations? So, Tina Ilton, Intelman. Yes, thank you, Charles. Uh, just, uh, just by way of, of uh, continuing uh, um, uh, on, on a little bit on, on the previous topic, you know, people were saying that, uh, Teresa was saying that we have this sense of pragmatism and Mart was saying that we have common sense. What I have found here that uh, we also, at, at least at times, we, shan we, we share a common sense of humor and that has made my tenure here very, very pleasurable. And now, uh, talking about the communities, certainly uh, there is this old community that was able to move here to the United Kingdom in connection with the Second World War. And it's because of the, the British generosity that these people are actually alive and, and, and were able to continue their, their lives here and were able to have children and grandchildren at, at this point. So we are very, very grateful for, for taking these, uh, uh, these people, these refugees, and, and allowing them to, to live in the UK. And there is also this younger community that moved uh, to the UK in connection with the free movement of, of people in, within the European Union. I think that both communities have contributed considerably uh, here also to the development of, of economy and, uh, and, and to, um, uh, you know, to, to normal uh, life and, and good life in, in, in the UK. I, um, I see that the younger generation is mostly involved in, in uh, IT in, in in cyber and 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 you know we have uh, we have a number of IT companies uh, that uh, have established one leg of their activity here in the UK because it's it's more easy to uh, to, to get funding here. So in, in terms of diplomatic relations or in terms of relations uh, in general, obviously these people do shape the direct over iteration because have IT companies that are working here. Obviously, we are also talking about IT. We are talking about innovation in our bilateral relations. We are trying to help other IT companies who come here to, to London um, uh, to establish them here or themselves here or, or to find contacts. Um, in terms of cultural cooperation, also, uh, uh, because there is this nice basis of, of Estonians in the United Kingdom, um, all that we're doing in, in cultural cooperation somehow gets amplified by way of, of these uh, traditional and, and new communities participating. So the contribution here, um, not in terms of political uh, contacts with the UK, because the political contacts are, are very good and, and close already, but, but in terms of everything else that is happening here, the, uh, the Estonian community is very active and, and we benefit a lot from, from, from them. Tina, thank you very much. Uh, Teresa, can you tell us a little bit about the British community in Estonia? I imagine it's very small, though it's interesting in the historical section that there was some discussion of the substantial British business engagement in Estonia, uh, particularly in the early 1920s, I think uh, Patrick and Karel said. But could you talk a little bit about what is the nature of the British community in Estonia today and uh, answer the question about its impact on general UK-Estonian diplomatic relationships? So, Teresa. Um, uh, yes, of course. Um, I didn't know much of what was in the historical presentations earlier on, so that was really interesting. I do know that there were Brits here um, from Manchester as early as the 1860s, working in the Craneholm um, textile factory in uh, Narva. So uh, the, the trading relationship certainly goes back a, a very long way, and certainly before independence. Um, and that is probably the basis, um, the, the reason for the presence of most of the Brits who live in Estonia these days. The numbers are indeed small, um, between, we think, 1,300, 1,400, something like that, probably about 10% of the, the numbers of Estonians living in the UK. Um, they are not a very homogenous community. They don't all live in the same place and do the same things. Um, quite a lot of them are, as far as I know, very happily retired um, in Estonia and uh, living 
quietly, not in Tallinn, out in the countryside. Um, and they perform various um, functions for me. That makes it sound a bit uh, um, sort of transactional. I don't mean it to. In a sense, every one of those is also an ambassador, just as every one of the 850 soldiers in Tapa is also an ambassador. They represent the United Kingdom and Estonians meeting those people will take them to represent the United Kingdom. So um, they are very, very important in helping us promote what the UK does and what we stand for. And that, of course, then works in the other direction because these are Brits um, who are, in, in almost all cases here, very much assimilated into the Estonian lifestyle. They have Estonian families, um, they work here, many of them have been here for many, many years. And so in a sense, for me, they are my eyes and ears or an element of my eyes and ears outside Tallinn, outside the diplomatic world, outside the political world. But I would again echo what, um, what Tina has said about the, the range of benefits that embassies and ambassadors gain from their own nationals in, in the host country. For us, there's a lot of trade. Um, these business people, as they are mostly, or they certainly were when they first came, are contributing to the prosperity of the United Kingdom, which is one of my main objectives through the work that they do. Um, and we find them in a range of other spheres. When I traveled around Estonia a couple of years ago for the centenary of independence, we found British soap makers in Saaremaa, one of the islands. We found British ballet dancers um, and British students in Tartu at the university. Um, we found a British company making bedding, duvets and pillows not very far from, from here in Tallinn. Um, and I was really struck by, by the, the sheer variety and the breadth of the, um, the expat community here. Um, it's been difficult to keep in touch with them as I would have liked over the last year, but uh, they are very much there and a very, very important part of the work that we do. Thank you, uh, Teresa. Matt, you're a professional diplomat. Uh, do you think that expatriate communities do play much of a role for professional diplomats like yourself? Or is it, uh, are they uh, fairly marginal, important for good relationships, important for cultural, for business, but not really important for your diplomatic work? Or do you see them as being assets in, in various ways that you can use, Matt? Well, it, it, it probably varies depending uh, on, on a person and the working style uh, of, of uh, different ambassadors, but uh, I, I can speak on, on my behalf. Uh, all those places where I have been working as ambassador, I, I extensively use Estonian communities in those countries because they uh, sort of they are the connection. They know both side, the Estonian side and the local side. So um, at least my personal experience is that uh, that they are a great asset. Um, uh, you just have to sometimes sort of work hard to remember if, if you're solving another problem that oh, but there is this those these people or or so they they have experience. So I can either ask advice or involve them in in different processes. Um, so I, I think um, it's um, it's. Uh, only positive contribution that um, that they can make and it depends on, on ambassador and diplomats how much they they, they want to involve uh, the, the people there and, and of course in in, in case of, of Tina there in, in London I mean the Estonian community in UK is um, is, is just great I think it is, is this bit of the split personality issue uh, or it, it may sound controversial but uh, we from the government side do everything to stop them going to London especially the tech people, startup community, um, we want to keep them in Estonia, but they do keep going to UK and, and we keep working and this sort of motivates us in Estonia to improve our business environment, uh, tech environment, startup legislation, so that, that uh, they would um, actually stay here and, and, um, and uh, not um, go and contribute to Tina's work in, in London. So we'll sort of, uh, uh, strangely enough, um, uh, 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 working in uh, in a direction that to, <laughs> not to have this nice community that, that back there in London. <laughs> then uh, to the historians, it's uh, perhaps a bit of perspective. Obviously, the role of diplomacy has changed a lot over these last hundred years. Communications have been transformed, and the role of an ambassador is different to what it was a hundred years ago. 
Um, are there anything, uh, are there ways in which this relationship, Patrick, you think has changed the role of being an ambassador? When you were talking in your introduction about the way in which the ambassador was having relations with ministers and so on, is that really how it is now, or is it uh, is it is it a different set of relationships building the the cultural and business relationships? Could you just talk a little bit about how you see that change having happened? Well, I mean, I could start with a with a very basic point, perhaps, that between the wars we didn't have ambassadors in all three. Baltic capitals, Kaunas as it then was, because Vilnius was had been uh, taken by Poland, um, Riga and Tallinn. We had simply one minister. They weren't called ambassadors then. Most most country most countries had ministers rather than ambassadors. We had one minister in Riga with consul generals in uh, Kaunas and Tallinn. So uh, this meant that you know the British diplomatic effort in the Baltic state was much much smaller than it is is now. Um, people like military attaches were also credited to several countries, so they didn't spend very long in one Baltic country. They were shared among several. Um, so the, the sheer amount of diplomatic activity going on uh, on a daily basis was much, much lower, much, much less intense than what one would now see. Another point was, of course, communications were quite difficult. Um, the communications in those days were the fastest way to communicate was by telegram and that of course was was fine uh you had to economize on words because words were expensive um so they didn't use them very often and for anything longer you got dispatches long letters on blue paper basically um which almost disappeared now but were still around were, were, were being still being used on quite a large scale when i joined the foreign office in, in 2003 and for sure uh, Teresa and others know them much better than I do. Um, but the, the, what's really changed, I think, and I'm again, I'm not an expert, I defer to the, the professional diplomats here, um, is the way in which um, embassies overseas are far more integrated into the whole decision-making process than was ever the case before. Um, in earliest times, of course, amb ambassadors did everything themselves because it took days or weeks for communications. But in the era of, of uh, telegrams from the, the mid 19th century onwards, um, the control was basically exerted from London. Uh, now that isn't the case. Um, the, the communications are varied. Uh, email, of course, is the basic communication. Um, we have dip tells instead of um, we have electronic telegrams. In other words, instead of traditional telegrams, and far more initiative, I think, is delegated uh, to um, to individual embassies. And of course. In the Nordic and Baltic region, we have a, a network of embassies which um, divide responsibilities and roles between them. Um, so this is this is part of modern life. Diplomacy has changed like every other aspect of modern life has changed. Um, at that point, I really have to say I'm not an expert, but there are diplomats here who are experts and could probably say a lot more. Thank you, Patrick. Carol, do you have anything to add? I know it's not your expertise. You might not want to say anything, but if you do, you're welcome to do so. Well, the only concern is uh, how uh, historians will, will be able to uh, study uh, diplomacy uh, in the future. So uh, the foreign, all the foreign ministries ha have to uh, um, find ways to, to um, store those um, documents, whether in, in electronic uh, form or, or, or in, in other forms. One of the um, points you made in our earlier discussions about this was the need to try and work on having good archival documents, um, including in the Estonian uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to be able to enable professional historians such as yourself to do the work in future that you want to do. That's right. Yeah. I'm, I'm now going to move to the security dimension, um, because obviously Britain may have uh, left the European Union, but it most certainly has not left uh, NATO. And that is a Im very important component in the relationship. And it's very interesting in the historical discussion how important defence was uh, in the relationship over over the past. And of course, how the massive security challenges at uh, the greatest possible level were there. So I'm now going to start with Matt and, and go round again, but to ask what you see as the major security challenges over the next, uh, say, 10 to 15 years uh, in the British-Estonia relationship in the Baltic regions? What are the things that you think we need to be thinking about uh, to deal uh, with in the most effective way? Matt, what do you see as the big security issues which are preoccupying you? 
Um, well, since we have this um, touch of history and 100 years um, today, I'll probably start with a notion that, uh, that, that there was a reason uh, for uh, Britain to be involved in, uh, in uh, Eastern Baltics uh, 100 years ago. Um, and I would claim that a lot of those reasons are still there. Uh, something has changed, but, um, but the reason why we have the, the uh, British troops uh, in Estonia a few, uh, less, less than 100 kilometers uh, from Russian border, the, the reasons are still there. Um, so that sort of brings me to to the, the sort of more mo modern view to the to the threat perception. I think the traditional challenges are still there, and our views um, to um, to Russia and and um, the, the the dangers and how to uh, do that is, is very similar. So we we share that vision with UK. So there's there's. Um, uh, no, no contradiction, and that's probably one of the reasons why this security cooperation has been so natural and deep and, and developed. Uh, and of course, that has now been um, uh, complemented by by the the new threats, uh, which is cyber and, and hybrid you know, threats, um, which which are new, which is more wider and more difficult to tackle. And um, I think we have found that again, sort of UK is one of the best partners uh, when we go and, and and see how to deal with those uh, uh, those new new uh, threats that that we are facing. And uh, I guess that's the reason why we have in in our uh, uh, bilateral strategy that I mentioned in in my speech, uh, which is sort of pretty much ready and 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 uh, will be soon implemented. There are big parts of uh, of how to deal with uh, cyber threats, uh, how to work with information campaigns, uh, so cyber challenges, uh, all those sort of new uh, areas where we found that we have to develop new capabilities, new ways to deal with it. So that's all in our um, bilateral um, uh, format. So, so yes, th th there are traditional threats. Uh, we know how to deal with uh, 100 years, actually, we could say already. We keep uh, working on that field. I think we are quite uh, uh, efficient, and and um, uh, and there are results. And we keep working with the new threats that that are popping up uh, in in uh, sort of not monthly, but every year we find out that that what we have to do uh, with those things, and um, and it, it sort of gives us also new ways of, of this diplomatic work that little bit brings us to the last question that, that we all know how much more we are using cultural diplomacy where we use local communities. Um, now there has been more of, of the, uh, cyber diplomacy. I think the science diplomacy is, is, is going more and more active. So there are sort of diplomacies going to many different areas of, uh, of everyday life where we have to work more because this security threats at the picture is, is is changing and the new threats are popping up so also the diplomatic and security policy work is is constantly changing and adapting to the situation thank you matt uh, teresa um from your point of view how do you think the british government analyzes the security threats in the reason in the region over the next decade or two teresa um, well, we will be about to get the official answer to this when we get the outcome of the integrated review of foreign security policy, which is going to come next month. So um, I don't want to preempt my, my ministers and their decisions on, on that. Um, what I would say is, um, first of all, we work with Estonia on defence and security, not just here in Estonia. We worked, as several others have referred to, in Afghanistan with them and we've lent them jackal vehicles, for example, from our military to use in Mali. So our cooperation is, is alive and well, and it's not just within these, these borders. Um, but I would agree with Matt's assessment that um, the reasons we were here in 1918 and the, the reasons we're here now have not really significantly changed. Um, when I speak to incoming British troops, they rotate every six months, so I do that fairly regularly. And I always remind them that they are here 
defending not only Estonia, but also Paris and Berlin and Washington and all the, the NATO capitals um, as we sit up here on NATO's northeastern border. Um, and I think that's a really important point. This is not big UK and big NATO sort of patting little Estonia on the head and, and keeping her safe. Actually, Estonia is very, very much a contributor to this effort and is an ally in, in every sense. Uh, maybe a small ally, maybe an ally without um, the budgets that the Pentagon have, for example, but um, very, very much a joint partner in this. Defence and security are not something we do to Estonia. Um, but if I were to, to guess what my ministers are, are thinking and what will be coming out, I think Matt is absolutely right again that the focus will be much less on traditional defence and security and much more on um, evolving uh, forms of attack. Mm -hmm. And um, cyber is, is obviously one of those um, and disinformation as well. Uh, the use of information as uh, in, in sort of warfare. And I think it's fairly clear that any attack on Estonia or, or much more widely in NATO is very, very unlikely to look like tanks rolling over the border in the way that we would have expected it to do decades ago. Um, much more likely these days to look like the, the lights going out or air traffic control going down in the first place. Um, and that sort of hybrid state that we would find ourselves in of not knowing whether actually something was happening or not. And so my educated guess would be that that will be the direction in which we'll be looking, that um, perhaps people with computers can be as powerful or even more powerful as people with tanks. But I absolutely don't think the tanks will go anywhere. They will still have a role. Uh, they're a very powerful symbol. Um, of deterrence uh, and also still incredibly practically useful but i i think cyber hybrid is probably the way that we'll be going thank you very much teresa um i uh, I'm, I'm going to go just to the final question we've only got three or four minutes left but it comes straight off the final question comes straight off that last point teresa makes about information and it's the, I'll ask all the panel this question and perhaps start with the historians. Um, and the question which has come through is, how much should foreign policies be affected and obey general morals, ethics and values of a society? So the question is, to what extent uh, is the uh, foreign policy of a given uh, uh, country affected by its values, its civilization, its way it sees things, and how has that come through? We heard from historians earlier on how that has been a case in previous history, but could you just make a kind of evaluative remark? And I'll go around all five of you uh, for answers on that before winding up the discussion this afternoon. So Patrick, what's your insight about the relationship between the values of a society and its foreign policy? Well, <laughs> I would say they ought to be identical, and there there'll always be cases where po foreign policy can't be can't be candid. Or, um, but if foreign policy based on trickery or deception, in the long run, is not probably going to be successful. Um, and you know, diplomats are products of society; um, they are members of it; uh, they represent it. And I don't think it would be in the interest of any country for its diplomacy to to veer very far from the core values of that society. That applies to Great Britain, it applies to Estonia, it applies to any other country, I think. That's enough from me, I think. Thank you. Uh, Carol, your observations on this relationship? Well, <clears throat> I, I agree with Patrick, and I think the key word uh, uh, most used uh, nowadays is, is, is identity, that uh, um, foreign policy of every country is, is based on uh, identity and and that again identity is based on on uh, readings of the past the the historical narratives that uh, uh, members of the nation tell uh, each other uh, and and but the foreign policy is also not something that uh, can be uh, can depend uh, entirely on, on public opinion because you know, as uh, for example, George Kennan has written 
public opinion uh, depend, uh, uh, tends to be very fickle. So, uh, and and it uh, doesn't produce uh, the best results if if, if foreign policy is de- dependent on on, for example, elections, uh, as it uh, uh, sometimes is uh, in 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 some countries. Thank you very much, Carol. Tina, uh, as a practicing diplomat in a variety of very interesting, as I introduced you, some very interesting arenas, and uh, should I say not a conventional diplomat, how do you see this relationship between ethics, mor- moral values, and foreign policy? Isn't it ironic that uh, the issue of Western values has become so topical nowadays? You know, we thought that we had sorted it out a long time ago. So um, uh, I, I, I think that all of these values are, are, are always an issue that we should bear in mind. And also nowadays we speak about the, resi- the resilience of societies, you know. Uh, a society that doesn't have values and that doesn't share values is not very res- resilient. And if we are speaking about the Western world, uh, what links us, what, what unites us, it is the values. If we forget the values and if we forget the values also in, in our foreign policy, there is actually very little that remains. Very, very little. Thank you. Mert, how do you see this? Well, I, uh, I, I, first of all, I agree with all the previous uh, speakers. I mean, the very good uh, statements and conclusions. Uh, and I'll probably just add uh, only one aspect to that. Um, um, you know, there was this old saying that, that you don't want to know how, how the sausages and diplomacy has made, uh, been made. But uh, with this nowadays technology and information, um, uh, you, you can't really hide much of this negotiation. I mean, it, it is confidential, but, but things move. The, the, the media is, is everywhere. So you, you, you can't really negotiate very differently from your sort of background and ethics um, um, with, with this nowadays. Uh, so it it, um, it doesn't take you far. And, and the technology is also one aspect there, maybe sort of really 100 years ago when we spoke. I mean, uh, that not much actually uh, was leaking from, from those negotiations. Uh, so it, it, it has changed dramatically. And all those reasons were mentioned. Uh, so you, you do actually work as a diplomat and negotiate uh, in the same level as is, is your uh, nations and your country's ethic and, and, and values. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to ask you to say anything just now, Teresa, but just to come to you, Teresa, and to Tina for the final closing remarks of this whole session. We're now at the end of the panel. And personally, I think we've had a very interesting and a very worthwhile discussion. Uh, and I want to thank all of the panelists for their contribution to this. But I want to end it by asking the two ambassadors to say a word or two about uh, the future and how this all is to symbolize the end of this celebration of 100 years of diplomatic relations. So, Teresa, would you like to kick off before I come to Tina? Teresa. Um, yeah, I would very much like to. Thank you very much. I think it's, it's worth noting that uh, we are holding this session today on the day that a new Estonian government was sworn in. And I had a chat with the Estonian president um, earlier on, and we were talking about the excitement of having a a new government. And for me, the way forward is, I think, the way that the the new government looks at the moment, which is um, committed to transparency, to diversity, to equality. Um, those, referring back to the previous question, are values which are also very dear to the UK. And I think it's about, it's against that background that we will go forward to uh, what we have been calling the, the next 100, 500,000 years of friendship between our, our two countries, um, as long as we remain like-minded, and I am absolutely certain that we will, for always, um, there will be I think nothing that we can't tackle together. Diplomacy is not always touchy-feely. It's often hard talking. It's about telling the truth, having difficult conversations behind closed doors. Um, But there is very little of that with Estonia. So I'm absolutely confident that as we move forward, as we look at the priorities we've discussed earlier on today, um, cyber, the defense issues, climate issues, um, 
all of those uh, really, really important subjects that we will do so completely on the basis of common values. Thank you very much indeed, Teresa. Tina, the final word is for you. I fully, fully agree with Teresa, but I also wanted to add that that I, I really hope that the bridges that exist between our people, be, between our common people, that these bridges will be strengthened. Um, politicians can decide a lot of things, but if they don't feel that uh, there is also the, the interest and the support of their electorate, um, they may run into, in, into problems. So I really feel that at least here uh, on the Estonian side, Estonia here in London, uh, we want to uh, we want to build more and, and stronger bridges. Thank you very, very much indeed, Tina. Well, just to repeat our thanks to everybody for contributing uh, today. I think it's been an excellent event and an excellent way of commemorating the 100 year anniversary of our diplomatic relationships between our countries. That is the end of today's video panel. I want to thank the panelists and also the audience for attending and all the technical people who've made this possible. It's not a straightforward process. And just to say, you'll soon be able to find a recording of this event on our Center for Geopolitics website if you want to see it again in the future. Many thanks and good afternoon.